Welcome, everyone. I'd like to welcome our speaker, Dr. Sarah Hamer. She is an associate professor of epidemiology in the College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences at Texas A&M University. Her research is focused on the ecology and epidemiology of diseases that emerge at the human wildlife domestic animal interface with a focus on vector-borne diseases. She earned her PhD in DVM from Michigan State University. She became a diplomat uh, in the American College of Veterinary Preventative Medicine in 2016 and served as the president of the epidemiology specialty from 2019 to 2021. Thank you, Dr. Hamer, and welcome. Great. Well, thank you for the introduction and a big thanks to the ACVPM Continuing Education Committee for inviting me to give a presentation today. I'm always really happy to speak about kissing bugs and Chagas disease, and I hope that this information will be useful. So um, moving forward, I'm going to focus in on studies that span different domestic animals, captive animals, wildlife, um, all kind of linked together by a vector and the parasite that it is. And before I, I plunge in, I wanted to acknowledge um, many of the awesome trainees uh, from here at Texas A&M University and faculty collaborators that have helped to lead the projects that I'm going to share with you today. And then also acknowledge some of our funding sources, um, which are listed here on this slide. And I'm going to try to specifically acknowledge the students and postdocs that were involved with these studies as we move through. So what I plan to do with our time here is to start with um, a background to the Chagas disease system introducing some of the key players, and then move forward with um, sharing the results of some focal studies on dogs, including their uh, clinical manifestations when they're infected with the Chagas parasite, and then um, our current and ongoing studies of wildlife reservoirs for this parasite. Okay, so to begin, um, Trypanosoma cruzi is a protozoan parasite, and this is the ideologic agent of Chagas disease. And Chagas disease, as you may know, is one of the neglected tropical diseases in the sense that it disproportionately impacts people living in poverty um, in tropical, subtropical climates. And it's neglected from um, many research arenas and funding arenas, and it does receive um, a lot of research attention in, you know, in relation to the human disease burden that it causes. There are estimates of 8 million people infected worldwide, predominantly across the Americas, which is where the insect vector is endemic. And you can see the map that's shown here, um, which uh, shows the disability adjusted life years per 100,000 population. And we can see the more intense that orange color, the higher human disease burden that's there um, with a lot of human disease reported from um, Mexico, Central America and South America. This parasite is vector borne. Um, by the triatamines, also known as kissing bugs, that I'll tell you more about in a moment. And the parasite has been uh, described as capable of infecting over 150 different species of mammals, mammals only, so birds, um, reptiles, amphibians, um, invertebrates, uh, not uh, considered reservoir hope for this parasite, um, just mammals. And in a subset of infected mammals, there can be disease outcome, typically in the form of cardiac or gastrointestinal disease. This is a really nice illustration of the life cycle of the T. cruzi parasite. And we can start um, in the part of this image here where you see the kissing bug or the triatamine up at top. And uh, infected triatamines will excrete or defecate the infectious stage of the parasite with their fecal material. And then that fecal material can come in contact with the host, the, the sleeping dog in the case of this picture. And that can be through um, the insect defecating uh, near a mucous membrane or while the insect is blood feeding, uh, which is what puts it in contact with the host, their mouth parts can make a little wound. And then if that feces gets rubbed into the bite wound, transmission can occur. Within the vertebrate host, the parasite will undergo some different changes in its life stage. Um, it goes from initially being bloodborne, and then it will localize into the heart or other organs where the intracellular stage of the parasite called the amastigote will replicate and then burst free from the cells, become bloodborne again, and the cycle continues, um, in some cases causing a lot of um, damage in the tissues along the way. 
When the parasite is in high levels in the blood, that's when a host would be infectious to the blood sucking vector that's feeding on us. And thus the kissing bug that's taking a blood meal will be able to pick up the parasite and the life cycle is continued. Okay, so the kissing bugs or triatomemes, these are the vector of Trypanosoma cruzi. And this image that you see at the bottom shows the full life cycle, starting on the far left where you see those really tiny little white eggs, those eggs will hatch into the first instar or first stage nymph. That little tiny nymph will take one or many blood meals from one or more different vertebrate hosts, and then it will molt and become a second instar nymph. And the same thing will happen again through five immature or nymphal stages. After that, the fifth instar will molt and become an adult, either male or female. And again, they'll blood feed potentially multiple times, mate, um, lay eggs, the female will, and die. And the whole duration of that life cycle, we don't really have good estimates, but it probably takes over a year, um, probably under two years, so something along, along those lines. What I wanted to point out is that the immatures do not have fully developed wings. They are not capable of flight. So when they need a blood meal, they're really restricted to blood feeding on something that's in proximity of their, you know, their environment. So usually we can find infestations of these nymphs around rodent burrows or wildlife dens, um, dog those areas where there's a reliable source of blood that these insects don't have to travel too far. In contrast, the adults are capable of flight. So we'll often get a report of someone who found a single adult in their home that may have been attracted to the light and the insect flew in. And that's very different than finding a bunch of these little nymphs in your home, which probably indicates a colonization event because again, they're not capable of flying in. So they probably um, you know, have been there since eggs were deposited. There are several modes of transmission of trypanosoma cruzi. I've been telling you about this vector fecal mode of transmission, which is shown in the first panel, but there's also very efficient oral transmission of the parasite. And in terms of human disease, this becomes a problem when humans are consuming juices or fruits that have been contaminated by insect feces or maybe ground up insects themselves, juices that aren't pasteurized uh, from fruits in endemic areas, for example. And that can lead to very devastating outbreaks of oral Chagas disease. Um, but we really think that this is very uh, relevant mode of transmission in veterinary medicine perhaps explaining the majority of canine Chagas disease cases that we see. And that would be if a dog or, you know, a wild animal consumes an insect intentionally or kind of accidentally, or maybe gets their nose up area that's infested with bugs and their feces and transmission could occur. There's also congenital transmission um, and estimates from human medicine is that um, 10% or less of infected female mothers will pass the parasite to their baby. We don't have a good understanding of how, uh, how efficient this mode of transmission is in veterinary medicine, but we do know that congenital transmission does occur. Um, and then there's some other less common routes of transmission shown in these pictures. So I want to focus in on our understanding of Chagas disease, ecology, and epidemiology in the United States. And I think we're a bit kind of behind in terms of our understanding relative to regions of Latin America, where there's more reports of human disease and a longer rich history of ecological research um, and just more awareness for these vectors and the parasite that they carry. But what we do know is that the triatamines have a broad distribution across many of the southern, and you can see that on the first map that's shown here from Byrne et al, published in 2011. Texas is a hotspot for a diversity of tri triatamine species. We've got a bunch of them here and they're highly infected. We also know that infected wildlife species are also broadly distributed across the United States. And you can see some of those species on the bottom map, coyotes, fox, wood rats, and so forth. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. And this, these insects, these parasites have been here in the Southern United States for uh, many, many years. Um, often we'll hear reports of, oh, they're moving north or, um, yeah, they're coming north across the border. Well, these are actually um, endemic insects and parasites that have been there. Um, and we're still trying to understand situations of a changing climate or uh, changes in the way that we're using land and how that impacts the parasite and the vector distribution. 
What we have less kind of certainty about is the human disease situation. Um, again, you can see a map uh, showing the prevalence of infection. Um, this is infected people per 100. And um, kind of noticeably absent from that map would be any activity in terms of human disease in the southern United States. And there's been some uh, a really nice recent review paper reviewing all of the reported autophagous or locally acquired human Chagas disease cases in the southern United States. And there were 76 reported over um, a 10 to 20 year period. So relatively small number, especially when we compare that to what were kind of the impulse of cases that we're seeing in veterinary medicine. And there could be some explanatory factors that describe this this disconnect where we have um, a lot of diagnosed infections in animals, but relatively uh, fewer in humans. Nonetheless, there's increasing attention for locally acquired human disease. And the more we're looking, um, the more is being found and reported. Um, in humans, Chagas disease is reportable in four states, Texas, where I'm at, also Tennessee, Massachusetts, and Arizona. And for a short period of time, um, it was also reportable veterinary cases in the state of Texas alone, um, but that reporting for veterinary Chagas disease has been uh, discontinued these past few years. Okay, so um, although kissing bugs or tratamines are considered a neglected vector of this neglected tropical disease, um, they're certainly not rare here in the United States. And I wanted to mention a kissing bug community science program this is a program that we've been running out of Texas A&M University since 2013, and it's ongoing and an active program. And at the end, I'll let you know how you might be able to submit insects that you find to this program if you're interested. But we've received over 8,000 insects, tritamines, from, through this program um, from 28 states. And the map of uh, human submissions of kissing bugs to the program is shown here on the right. And of course, the majority of the insects that we've received come from Texas, which is where we're doing the most outreach and people know about our lab and the program. But you can see all of the states that have participated um, in the program shown here. And furthermore, um, these insects are highly infected. So there is some geographic variation that relates to the different species of triatamines that are found in different areas around the Southern United States. But overall, when we look at the adult life stage of triatamines kind of aggregated across species, we find about 60% are infected. So more than half. And in fact, it's rare to find um, a good population of triatamines um, that are completely uninfected. Some exceptions that come to mind would be triatamines that we've collected um, from a chicken coop um, or a tortoise pen, where we know those, uh, those hosts are incompetent reservoirs. But for the most part, where we can find a good number of kissing bugs, we find at least some that are infected with trypanosoma cruzi. Okay. Although there's a lot of kissing bugs out there, and although they're highly infected, as I just showed, um, they're, at least as indexed by our community science program, they're encountered by people mainly in the outdoor settings as compared to inside, and they feed predominantly on wildlife and dogs. So this table here is just showing um, some of the environments where these kissing bugs were reported to be collected from, and you can see 74% were outside in comparison to only 26% that are found inside. So these species of triatamines that we have, these robust populations of across the southern United States, they're largely sylvatic or kind of associated with wild outdoor environments. In contrast, some of the species you might be familiar with, like triatoma infestans from um, South America, they uh, thrive more in an indoor setting. They're domesticated species. Ours are just a bit different here. We certainly do have domestication of triatamines in the United States. It's just more rare compared to these outdoor collections. And with respect to their feeding patterns, this pie chart here shows the result of a blood meal, a molecular blood meal analysis. And this is work that Dr. Sujata Balasubmaranian had a part in. And we can collect these insects that are submitted by members of the public to our program or from our own field work. And we can dissect their gut material and then do a DNA extraction and a series of PCRs and sequencing from that gut material. And the whole idea is there might be dual traces of blood from their previous blood meal. And we can figure out what did they feed on. And when we do that technique from bugs submitted to this community science program, we find out about half of them 
um, have fed on a dog, but there's other hosts represented, including raccoons, humans, chickens, and so forth. And lately we've been performing this molecular blood meal analysis, but using next generations, you know, deep Amplicon deep sequencing technologies, where we can get an understanding of not just the most abundant source of DNA in the vector's gut or the most recent source of DNA in the vector's gut, but the whole community of hosts that individual bugs may have fed on previously. We can see this bug here called AZ85. It had a lot of sequences devoted to toad, but also human, squirrel, and dog. Another one that was squirrel and human. Here we've got one that was predominantly sheep and ringtail and so forth. So you can see these networks can be created of different hosts that are kind of linked together by a vector. And we hope to use this information to figure out if that vector is infected, where could it have picked up the infection and to whom could it have transmitted the infection during its life. And we're active with these sorts of studies, collecting insects ourselves or from the public, figuring out if they're infected, what's the genetic strain of the parasite, what did the insects eat on, in different um, eco-regions and different um, epidemiologic settings. For example, this is from some of our work at Big Bend National Park, where we can see um, all the pictures are the blood meal hosts from the insects that were collected there. There are residential dogs and humans that live in the park, so in some respect, these um, findings can make sense. And this is where we have the one and only observation of a kissing bug, that's blood meal analysis result was the elf owl, which is the tiniest, world's tiniest species of owl, and it's known to nest in the park. So it's just amazing to think of this big kissing bug taking a blood meal probably in the nest of one of these elf owls. So the scenario that has come together in terms of the triadamines in the United States is that we've got a lot of these sylvatic species that really thrive um, in these outdoor sylvatic environments where they're maintained by different members of the wildlife community. Um, and this figure comes from a review paper where the hosts in the screen circle um, were uh, viewed as important in terms of uh, feeding kissing bugs and infecting kissing bugs. And under certain scenarios, these same insects from these sylvatic settings might disperse into domestic or peri-domestic environments. And that's where people or our dogs might be at more risk for encountering kissing bugs. And I'd like to make the point to emphasize here that it's not just, um, you know, I hope you're understanding it's, it's not just the mud wall, thatch roof settings that you might have heard about when you think about Chagas disease and sort of the colonization of home environments, but also really well manicured homes like this home here in the bottom right of the slide where these homeowners have submitted kissing bugs to our program that they found inside their home. And then also um, there are some risk factors in terms of the type of housing, um, houses that might lack screens on windows or have cracks and crevices where the insects can get in um, are more likely to have triadamine infestations. Okay. And this is a problem. There's um, not vaccines available for human or veterinary Chagas disease, limited antiparasitic treatment options. So a lot of work to kind of reduce the risk of Chagas disease focuses on the environment and on the vectors and on vector control and using integrated approaches for vector management, environmental management. And I'll speak on some of those in a moment. So with that background, I wanted to now um, plunge in and show you first some of our dog studies and then some of the highlights about wildlife work um, that together I hope will paint the picture that there's a lot of host species involved, which makes this a very complex um, ecology to this disease system. So dogs, diverse types of dogs can be infected with trypanosoma cruzi. Some of them will uh, develop Chagas disease. And these pictures are taken from uh, some patients here at Texas A&M. Um, I work very closely with Dr. Ashley Saunders and the veterinary cardiology team here. And they very regularly see patients refer to them with Chagas disease um, and different types of uh, myocarditis and, and other ailments. And you can see here with this um, histopathology picture, um, what I mentioned earlier is the intracellular stage of the parasite that will go into the cardiac myocytes and replicate. So every one of those little tiny purple dots um, by the arrows is, um, is a parasite that will eventually be the blood again. 
And there are many different groups of dogs that have been studied in terms of um, their involvement and the impact of Chagas disease. And you can see some of those groups listed here, hunting dogs. I'll show you some data from some of the government working dogs, um, dogs at shelters and so forth. When we began here, our research team at Texas A&M, when we began to study Chagas disease from the dog perspective, um, we first thought to um, study dogs at animal shelters because across many different vector-borne disease systems, dogs or animals arriving to animal shelters, especially those that come as um, strays, you know, picked up off the street, um, have proven to be very uh, effective sentinels or, you know, sensitive indicators of the level of um, uh, disease activity across the landscape, just because they probably are spending a lot of time outdoors. They usually aren't protected in the form of, um, you know, anti-vector prophylaxis. Um, so they provide a good indication of whether or not there's uh, pathogen transmission activity in an area that's been shown for different tick-borne diseases, for example. So with that in mind, we formed a network of different shelters across several different eco regions in Texas. And at these shelters, we sampled um, 30 dogs each at three different seasons per shelter. Our overall sample size was just over 600 dogs. And overall, we found about 18% of the dogs met the positivity criteria um, for being infected with trypanosoma cruzi for this study. And that 18% of dogs was statistically indistinguishable from the heartworm prevalence in the same exact dogs. We tested them for multiple vector-borne agents. Um, there were also some tick-borne pathogens present in these dogs that you can see from this Venn diagram. But the takeaway here is that infected dogs were kind of widespread, especially at least across these Texas eco-regions, um, at a prevalence that the veterinary community, um, you know, we pay so much attention to heartworm, of course, there's things that we can do about that. Um, and in contrast, there's very little awareness for trypanosoma cruzi infection, in part because it's hard to test for it, and we don't have many tools at our disposal to be able to do much about it. But nonetheless, it infects a sim similar prevalence of dogs. We then set up um, some research studies in South Texas in the Rio Grande Valley, um, right along the border with Mexico in the region that's indicated by the red box on this map. And in particular, there is a high density of communities known as colonias, um, which are predominantly Hispanic um, and impoverished communities, often you know, will lack some uh, basic features, maybe don't have paved roads or not a reliable source of water. Um, and in general, there's, there's poverty in these communities. You can see some of the typical housing structures. And it's because of those housing structures and the high densities of free roaming dogs and cats that we wanted to better understand if animals and people in these communities might have a higher um, risk of encountering the vectors um, than in other types of communities. And so we set up a research program in and around the Colonias. And this was a, a One Health program um, in which we did a lot of community outreach and working with the local communities to provide informational material about kissing bugs and other vectors. And in return, we encouraged them um, if they wanted to come and um, allow us to sample them. Um, so we had these pop-up tents and on one side we would be collecting um, data and blood samples from the humans and on the other side, the same from dogs. And we wanted to kind of explore at the household level if people and dogs shared exposures or not. And this was greatly facilitated by a close working relationship with a community healthcare worker, Promotora, that had experience working in these communities and really allowed our research team to better access the communities. And then we also offered a free rabies vaccine, which was one very nice small step that I could do as a veterinarian in these communities, because a majority of these dogs have received no, veter no or very little veterinary care in their lives. And it was very rare to find a dog that had already been vaccinated for babies. So that completely unrelated to our project goals, but a nice small public health step that we could do while we were there. <clears throat> and what we found is that these dogs um, in the colonias were highly exposed to trypanosoma cruzi. Overall, about one third of the dogs that we sampled um, had reactivity on multiple uh, diagnostic tests that we used. Um, a lot of the, the way that we would categorize animals as positive would be based on um, detection of antibodies to trypanosoma cruzi, either from indirect fluorescent antibody testing 
or an off and or an off label use of um, some human validated immunochromatographic tests that we could use for research purposes in these in these settings. Um, and then we also would use uh, our polymerase chain reaction to detect parasite DNA in the dog's blood. Um, and we also found um, a small number of humans that met the positivity criteria for the study as well, um, including some that shared the same houses as these infected dogs. And we did our best to point them to um, federally qualified um, healthcare clinics um, where they could be further evaluated and potentially um, uh, candidates for treatment for trypanosoma cruzi infection. Okay, so moving forward, um, the, we've done a lot of work over the years at multi-dog kennels where we've got high density of dogs in confined spaces. An example of one of this is shown here. This is from a kennel that's in West Texas. Uh, well, not too far west. This is just west of San Antonio. And we set up time-lapse cameras in these kennels to try to capture pictures of the vector activity at night while the dogs are sleeping. And that's what you can see here um, is the sleeping dog. And the pictures were taken at 15 second intervals. And you can see a triatamine that's sort of coming toward the paw of the dog. It was there for a period of minutes and then it, it left. And at this particular kennel, which is one that we're still active with research today, um, there's a long history of loss of dogs due to Chagas disease. And they're active with different forms of vector control now. Um, so you can imagine if that's happening night after night that these sleeping dogs are just getting plastered with bug bites. Um, occasionally those insects might be defecating. Occasionally they might be infected. You can see how this cycle might amplify in nature. We have been fortunate to be able to work um, closely with the Department of Homeland Security owned working dogs um, for several years. And we're hoping to find a way to continue this work into the future. We're in funding cycles right now. Um, but these dogs, due to the uh, large amount of time that they spend outdoors and the type of work that they do, we were curious to know their level of exposure to Trypanosoma cruzi. And so um, nationwide, including all of the different um, sectors of work, including border patrol and port of entry dogs, as well as the TA dogs that you see in the airport, and Coast Guard dogs, Federal Protective Services, and I suspect there's a few other groups that I'm leaving off. When we look at them nationwide, we found out about 7.3% of these dogs were infected. And notably, this included some infected dogs in Northern states that were well outside that southern range of where we know infected kissing bugs um, reliably occur. And although we don't know for sure, uh, perhaps this can be explained because these dogs will spend time in the southern United States training um, before they're then deployed to northern states. And it could be that they are um, picking up this infection while spending time in the south and then being dispersed to other regions, which could be a problem, especially if there's even lower veterinary awareness for Chagas disease in the north where the vectors don't occur. Um, our focal studies in some higher risk regions in Texas and New Mexico revealed even um, a higher infection prevalence of the dogs there. And then we wanted to better understand, all right, well, what does this mean in terms of the dog's ability to work? Or you know, what's the, the consequence of these infections? Because um, by speaking with the dog handlers and owners of infected dogs, even in other types of dogs, not just these working dogs, um, many infected dogs seem to be living a, you know, a happy, healthy life. Um, and we're real interested you know, to predict, can we continue on that happy, healthy trajectory or are there indicators that a dog might develop clinical signs? Um, so with a focus on heart monitoring, we were able to use ambulatory EKG monitors, so electrocardiograms that we could put on the dogs wrap them up so they hopefully wouldn't bother these monitors and then they'd go back to their working duties um, at the ports of entry or along the border and then 24 hour later we could remove these monitors and then um, have this you know full disclosure tracing and my collaborator again dr ashley saunders who's a, a veterinary cardiologist um, could look through and we did a lot of categorization of the different types of cardiac abnormalities that were present we also see i have used some other tools that you can see here in the pictures and just a brief snapshot of some of the data that we found from these dogs. And to set the stage, we were tracking and enrolled and following forward dogs known to be infected with Chagas disease, as well as a matched population of dogs that were negative for trypanosoma cruzi infection. 
Um, and those are depicted by the red and blue colors, respectively. And then we also followed a population of these working dogs that we labeled as discordant. Um, one of the major challenges for Chagas disease um, in humans as well as animals is that there's not one perfect diagnostic test. Um, and if we run a series of tests, inevitably there's often discordance where one test will say positive and another might say negative, or there might be different intensities of positivity. So we had some of these animals with discordant results that we tracked. And what we found is that um, maybe not surprisingly, the positive dogs had um, more frequency of um, ECG abnormalities as shown by the bar graph here, including first and second degree AV block that occurred also in some negative dogs, but at a, lo at a lower frequency. And then the bottom left graph is showing the serum concentration of cardiac troponin I, which is a biomarker of cardiac injury. And so we hypothesized that this would be higher in dogs that are known to be infected with trypanosoma cruzi. And indeed that's what the data showed. Um, so this is just a bit of clinical information to indicate that there are differences between the infected and uninfected dogs. And in some very sad cases, um, the outcome can be death of these animals. And this is a, a case series that we recently published detailing the circumstances surrounding the death of five government working dogs within a six month period. And these dogs are all shown here along with um, pathology in their heart. And in all cases, the cause of death was attributed to trypanosoma cruzi. And so this is certainly significant considering the important role that these dogs play um, for our family in terms of um, security and protection purposes. And it's for these reasons now, um, we hope to be able to move into a phase of intervention. So now that we've described this unfortunate problem with infected dogs um, and some of the clinical outcomes, what can be done to help mitigate some of this? Uh, and again, a lot of that will focus on vector control, habitat management. Um, I wanted to mention also that I, I spoke a little bit about some of these diagnostic tests, whether it's looking for antibodies in the blood, looking for circulating parasite in the blood. For research purposes, we've also been using a diagnostic technique called xenodiagnosis. And the idea here is for some of our research, we don't just need to know whether an animal is infected or not, but knowing if, it, if an infected animal actually could infect a vector that's feeding on it. That's a very biologically relevant measure of infection that's important when trying to understand the ecology of this system. So does it have a high enough level of circulating parasites in its blood that could actually infect a vector based on the amount of blood that that vector is imbibing? So for the, using an indirect xenodiagnosis where we can take blood from an animal in the field, bring it back to the lab, and then feed it to our colony of kissing bugs that we have in an arthropod containment uh, facility here at Texas A&M. That's a collaboration between the vet school and the Department of Entomology. We make these tubs of insects and they can be fed through an artificial membrane blood feeder. So we can put the candidate animal's blood in the feeder and then they'll pierce through that membrane and feed. And then we can follow those bugs, in particular testing their fecal spots for infection to try to answer these more uh, relevant, biologically relevant questions about infection of not just dogs, but also some other animals that I'll mention here. And um, yes, when we, when we test chronically infected dogs that are asymptomatic, at least based on their owner's definition, we find that in some cases they do successfully infect vectors that feed upon their blood. Now, I, I really hope that as I move forward with our own research in Chagas disease and collaborating with other teams that have been at this for a while, that we'll be focusing on interventions and what can we do about this problem. And some of the work that my lab is excited to be involved with now in, in, in the field of interventions um, has to do with vector control through host targeted insecticides. So can we treat the wildlife reservoirs? Can we treat the dogs with products that are safe but would effectively kill the kissing bugs that try to feed on them. And if we do that and scale that up enough, could we actually suppress the vector population in nature? And if we have that suppressive effect, then we're protecting the animals and the humans that are around uh, by vector control. So to start into this intervention wave of studies, we're using some safe commercially available products that you can see here in the figure that have been shown to be effective in killing 
fleas and ticks, for example, and test whether or not they would kill triatamines that feed upon the blood of dogs treated with these products. And from our bioassay results where we've treated dogs in the field and then fed the blood to kissing bugs through those membrane feeders, we can see that some of these products alone or in combination with each other are quite effective in killing kissing bugs. And we're really happy to have um, a, a small amount of new funding from the American Kennel Club to be able to now try out this intervention in some of these large multi-animal uh, multi kennel environments um, where we can achieve a high threshold of coverage in terms of these host insecticides and try to monitor the vector population throughout that time period. Okay. So now I would like to share with you some of the work that um, we and other research teams have been doing with wildlife and kind of point out some of the key players um, along the way. And um, we, for several years, have been working with um, the director and others at the Austin Zoo right here in Texas. Um, and they had actually submitted some insects to our community science program that were labeled to have come from the zoo. And in speaking with them, um, they had lost some wolf hybrids over the years due to tragus infection. So we collected some more insects and used the collections that they sent to us and did that blood meal analysis technique. And you can see some of the species that were found. And again, these could be viewed as species important in kind of maintaining the vector population. They're providing blood meals to the vectors in this location. Um, and, you know, from that, some of them make sense in, you know, finding American black bear or a black and white colobus, um, you know, makes sense when you can consider this insect was collected near the black and white colobus at the zoo. So it's always exciting to, you know, to do this type of work and have it make sense um, and just learn more about the host range that can support these insects uh, through their wildlife feeding. Um, and diverse it is. So this particular walrus that you can see in this picture um, from a, a captive animal facility was uh, actually infected with Trypanosoma cruzi. And you can see the very picture from its blood smear uh, shown in the upper right. And this is a, a trypomastigote that's shown here in the picture. And um, uh, we were brought in to try to better characterize the infection from samples from the animal but became interested in what's the habitat like and could this support vectors? And so we were invited to go uh, to this facility and collect vectors and get to meet the animal up close and personal. And I wanted to share this picture today because this is a very special picture for me because it was on the same day that I received my pin for um, joining ACVPM um, at the AVMA conference that was in the same town at the same time. So very special moment for me, but nonetheless, um, triatamines were collected from this facility and found to be infected. And so again, you just get a picture for this kind of flexible ecology of locations where the insects might be um, able to contact hosts that we might not even be, be thinking about in terms of vulnerability um, to the infection. And um, living in Texas, I quickly had learned about um, various predator hunts um, that occur across the state at different times of year. And um, these are activities where hunters with legal permits can harvest animals. And some of them are set up as contests or competitions where these hunters can then bring these animals back. They have a fixed period of time to make a harvest and then they bring the animals back to a central checkpoint. And similar to research teams that will be checking and collecting samples from deer that are harvested by hunters, we can do that here with these um, meso mammals. And this has been very um, useful to be able to learn something from the lives of these animals by being able to collect tissues, uh, blood samples and so forth for our, our Chagas disease and other studies. And from some of this work, um, we have been able to learn a little bit about the relative levels of infection of some of these key wildlife species. We can see anywhere from 12 to 14% of bobcat, coyote, and fox from central Texas were confirmed to be um, infected on the basis of PCR positivity of their heart tissue. And in contrast, a much higher infection prevalence in the hearts of raccoons. So we're starting to think a little bit more about what's now the density of these different animals across the landscape, what's their ability to kind of come in um, to domestic or peri-domestic environments. 
Um, and here's some more pictures from these unique sampling events. Um, and this focused a little bit more on coyotes um, and we could collect them through these hunter harvested events and then also a really nice collaboration with the Texas Department of State Health Services um, that were already sampling coyotes for their rabies vaccination surveillance program. And we could have a secondary use of some of the tissues that were collected there. And from that work, we were able to compare uh, coyotes and raccoons. And again, we get another independent data set that's showing coyotes are infected, about 8.2% of them, but raccoons from the same areas have a much higher infection prevalence in this data set, over 60% of the animals. And then taking the study a step further, what does it mean in terms of the health of these animals? Could they be exhibiting clinical signs of disease? Of course, if the clinical signs were so severe, we might not have them represented in our sample. Maybe a, a hunter wouldn't harvest them or they wouldn't have been collected um, through our collection means. But there were some differences um, in the sense that coyotes, while they were less likely to be infected with T. cruzi than raccoons, they seem to have a little bit more severe pathology in the heart um, compared to the raccoons. And furthermore, there were some pretty strict host associations of the gen different genetic variants of the parasite. So Trypanosoma cruzi has um, a lot of genetic variability and there's different ways that we can categorize the parasites' um, genetics. Some are thought to be more pathogenic than others. There's certainly different geographic distributions of these different variants, but there's also different vector associations and different host associations that have been revealed as well. Another setting where um, there are issues, unfortunately, with Chagas disease are at biomedical research facilities, of which there are several that occur in the southern United States in regions that are endemic for triads and trypanosoma cruzi. And so we um, were kind of brought in to help with some research at one such facility in central Texas. We've actually been doing some Chagas disease work at a few non-human primate research facilities in the south. But at one in particular, we were able to not only track infections in the non-human primates themselves, but also in the wildlife that shared space with these animals. And as you can imagine, um, you know, having these non-human primates that become infected with Trypanosoma cruzi, presumably by virtue of contact with vectors that occur in the environment, that are able to access the monkeys um, in you know, semi-outdoor exclosures or exclosures that have um, you know, features that the insects might be able to get in. Um, that can create some real hardships because now these animals have this existing infection and they might be less useful for biomedical research purposes. Um, and there's real concerns with what, how to manage for this. And could, could it, one infected monkey serve as a source of infection to others, for example? Um, so just, again, kind of from an ecological perspective, um, we were able to work with this facility in Bastrop, Texas, and uh, not only sample the rhesus macaques, but then also the wildlife that occurred uh, at the facility, including rodents, um, skunks, raccoons, and possums, and couple that with vector surveillance that we were doing both actively and passively at the facility. And overall, there were small sample sizes, but infected wildlife uh, were quite common. In fact, most of the small number of possums, raccoons, and skunks that we collected uh, were infected with diverse strains of Trypanosoma cruzi. Um, in contrast, the rodents were not. Um, but one of the most interesting take one of the interesting takeaways from this research study is when we look at the level of parasite in the blood of the macaques versus the wildlife. What we see is overall, um, it's a, a higher CT value, which means a lower amount of parasite DNA circulating in the blood of the monkeys versus the raccoons, skunks, and possums. So the raccoons, skunks, and possums, potentially being these wildlife reservoirs, had a higher level of circulating parasite, which we might interpret, but haven't shown, to be more infectious to the vectors that are around compared to um, the monkeys. So moving forward, the list just keeps going on and on, um, not just with what we're doing at Texas A&M, but other research groups as well. Again, underscoring the broad host range of this parasite and why it is so hard to manage in nature um, because it infects so many species. Feral hogs have been shown to be infected. Um, and feral hogs, as we know, have a broad distribution that seems to be moving north. Uh, looking at bats, for example, bats and different trypanosomes, there's a long history, a long evolutionary history, 
but we were interested in the focal research question of whether uh, a migratory uh, Mexican or Brazilian free-tailed bats that we have high densities of here in Texas um, could be infected with Trypanosoma cruzi. So again, we were able to couple our own uh, field efforts with a nice collaboration with um, the state health department that receives a lot of bats for rabies testing. And we were able to um, have a material transfer agreement and work with the rabies negative bats in our biosafety level two conditions um, to collect heart tissue and test that for trypanosoma cruzi. And this was work that was done by then graduate student and now um, pathologist, Dr. Carolyn Hodo. Um, these are pictures from on the mist netting of bats that focused in and around caves. Um, using mist nets, either strung up or kind of handheld um, devices like this with PVC tubing. Um, this work was a lot of fun because we were able to involve um, vet students in the summer uh, research training program that could come out and collect bats um, in the field and sample these bats. And we were able to collect diverse species. Um, and uh, a good sample size of these bats um, over the life of this study. But in the end, we found uh, very low infection prevalence with Trypanosoma cruzi. In fact, only a single bat was found to be infected with T. cruzi with an overall sample size of about 600. But there were several trypanosome species that were present. Um, Trypanosoma dionysii, a blastocrithidia species. Um, the, the public health importance of these um, doesn't seem to be I don't think they're known to cause any human disease, but how they might interact with um, the trypanosoma cruzi in the bats is to be determined. Okay. And then on the topic of bats, it's been over a year now, but you might remember this big Texas snowstorm that happened. Oh gosh, has it been, did I put the wrong date? Yeah, it's been over a year now, that's just 2021, but the polar vortex that we had. Um, and there were unfortunately massive bat die-offs that occurred as a result of these unseasonably cold temperatures. And under um, a salvage permit, we were able to collect some of these freshly dead bats from under these highway roosting sites. And currently um, new PhD in Ilana Mosley, who's shown here, um, working with a postdoc, Dr. Alex Pavulin and PhD student Ed Davila are working the, through these bats to um, understand their level of infection and exposure to multiple zoonotic agents, including Trypanosoma cruzi. Possums, so we've been working with possums, um, especially uh, down in the Rio Grande Valley where there's high density of Virginia possums and they're almost viewed as a nuisance in some areas, as you can see from that news clip. Um, in work led by Italo Zecca, who came in uh, to Texas A&M with an MPH degree and finished his PhD. And now he's a, a CDC ORISE fellow with the One Health Group. Um, he conducted a focal study of these possums, which are really remarkable because the brilliant work of other scientists has shown that possums not only can be infected with Trypanosoma cruzi, but they can secrete the infectious stage of the parasite with their anal secretions, which are some of the pictures that are shown here. So a lot of interest in this species. And we find a lot of infected possums. Um, overall, about 15% of the samples that Dr. Zeka worked with were infected, um, including some animals that had multiple tissue types test positive uh, for different strains of Trypanosoma cruzi. Okay. Furthermore, there was... Um, uh, some lesion, lesions that were found histologically on these animals um, in the form of cardiac inflammation, um, which was more severe in the Trypanosoma cruzi infected animals compared to the uninfected animals. And then I think the, one of the final species that I wanted to mention here as, as, as I'm wrapping up um, kind of gets into the realm of, you know, conservation medicine and how can we better understand these, um, you know, transmission cycles of these infectious agents across the landscape? Um, you know, my interest has been in as it relates to health or, you know, dog health, but now the health of uh, an endangered species uh, being a wild cat called the ocelot. And you can see the historic range um, of ocelots. And we do have some ocelots now that occur um, in kind of a remnant population um, in South Texas, and the range used to be much, much broader than what you see here. Um, and uh, they, there's many threats um, against these ocelots. I think a lot of the mortality that occurs down in South Texas in and around Laguna Escota National Wildlife Refuge is um, when these animals are hit by cars. Um, 
And uh, there are several infectious diseases that might be relevant to these cats, but we were able to work with the biologists and um, with salvage permits, um, access some of the tissues from these animals that ultimately had died um, and ask the question, were they infected with trypanosoma cruzi? Um, so through this work, um, again, it was small sample sizes, but I think when we're dealing with a, a species of, um, of conservation concern, um, we can't expect very large sample sizes, um, but we, uh, we were able to access different tissues from the heart, from different muscles, uh, blood clots, and we did uh, ro you know, describe robust infections in a few of these animals, about 14.3% of the samples um, of the animals were confirmed to be infected. Um, and unfortunately the histology, although we attempted, um, the tissues were so autolyzed that it wasn't uh, very useful. Um, the good thing is one of the cats, one of the three that we found to be infected was actually a live capture that we had a blood sample from. And it was observed to be alive and well um, after we had diagnosed that infection. Um, and it was caught on a trail cam. And that's the picture that you see here. So in conclusion, just kind of a couple conclusion notes to kind of pull this all together. Um, you know, why do these wildlife infections matter? Um, or even, you know, dog infections, everything that I've been talking about. Well, in terms of the wildlife, um, does it affect their health? Um, and that might especially be relevant for species of conservation concern, as I mentioned with the ocelot. Could infected animals, whether domestic or wild animals, uh, serve as vehicles for the mixing and movement of the parasite? Um, I, I showed you that map where we had these working dogs um, in northern states that were infected with trypanosoma cruzi. Is that a signal of infections that might occur in one location and get transported to another location? Maybe that's a good thing in the sense that now those dogs are removed from the vectors and they're not going to serve as a source of infection to local vectors that can then transmit to another animal. But on the flip side, if these dogs do develop you know, uh, clinical manifestations of their infection, they might be with veterinarians that might not think about this threat because it's not relevant in their own uh, geographic area. The same is true with humans, you know, um, moving of humans that might be infected in one way, one area and move to a new location. Um, parasite reservoirs. So I tried to set the stage that not all infections are equal um, in, the, in the sense that some animals can be infected but not necessarily be infectious to the vector. So from the parasites perspective, they're kind of a dead end host. Um, in the contrast, you know, raccoons uh, seem to have these high blood levels of circulating parasite. They can infect the vectors that feed on them. And then, you know, if we identified some of these key wildlife species that are involved in transmission cycles or disproportionately are giving blood meals to kissing bugs, could we actually use them as a management tool, treat them with these systemic insecticides, for example? out in nature to try to reduce the vector populations. And same for dogs. And then some of the information that I'm getting, you know, these infection prevalence of species A and B, we're really gathering that to better parameterize these models of reservoir potential um, or even vector competence, trying to understand not just who's infected and who isn't, but how frequently are they fed on by the vectors and putting this all together to identify the key species that are most relevant for maintaining the system in nature. And ultimately, if we had the clues and all the answers there, the goal would be um, protection of both human and animal health. So again, an acknowledgement to um, some of the trainees and faculty and staff collaborators that I've been working with and our funding sources. And I also wanted to, um, again, thank ACDPM and also um, in particular recognize the epidemiology specialty, which has been a really um, nice network to be involved with these past few years. Um, and um, if you find a kissing bug, <laughs> I wanted to just plant the seed for kissingbug.tamu.edu. And that's the website for our community science program. And there you'll find a little tab where you can submit a bug. Um, if you've got a picture of it, that's great because we can take a quick peek at it. There's a lot of lookalike species out there that aren't kissing bugs and cannot transmit this or any other human pathogen to you. So we're always happy if someone says those, we can say no need to worry. Um, but the, the community submissions have been really important for moving forward some of these research initiatives. So we welcome, um, welcome you to reach out to us that way. Thank you.
Okay, great, Dr. Hamer. Uh, that was an excellent presentation. We do have several questions. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get to all of them. I'll go ahead and pose a few of them. One individual asks, you know, if kissing bugs are the same as what we call stink bugs, uh, because they do have a similar appearance. If so, do you know that the giant Joro spider, originally from Japan, now is in the U.S., and it is susceptible to Chagas disease organisms, and it is its diet consists of stink bugs. It eats stink oh, bugs. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> I heard about, this, heard about the spider and seen some impressive pictures lately, but no, stink bugs and triatamines or kissing bugs are, um, are different, but there is, you're right, some morphological resemblance. So stink bugs is one of the species that we get a lot of um, worried members of the public that will reach out to us and, and say, I found this and I want to get tested for Chagas disease, um, but they're, they're different. Um, so that's good. So hopefully later <laughs> is not going to be involved with trypanosoma cruzi transmission, even if it's eating a bunch of stink, stink bugs. Thank you. All right. Uh, next question with, is uh, regarding human infection. For humans that had evidence of Chagas, did you examine travel history or nationality? And do you have a sense of how much autochthonous human transmission was occurring versus imported Chagas disease? Yeah, that's a, a important question. Um, and yes, so that small study that I had presented the, the highlights of um, in the colonias along the border of the Texas-Mexico border. Um, yes, part of the, the human survey that we asked um, all of the participants was about um, where they were where they were born, had they had an extensive travel history anywhere. We had a whole set of questions. And the vast majority of people who participated in our study were born in Mexico. Um, but when we, we narrowed it down in that study, we identified four people that met the criteria of being positive based on our research-based testing that we did. Um, and one of them was born in the U.S. and had no travel history to Latin America. Um, but certainly that's like relevant uh, question. You might be aware that um, uh, antibodies to trypanosoma cruzi is one of the um, tests when you donate blood for the first time at a, bl a blood bank here in the United States, your blood is screened for many different infectious agents or exposures and T. cruzi antibodies is one of them for first time blood donors at least. Um, and you can see the data, all of the people who at least screened as positive across the country for T. cruzi antibodies, and they learned from their blood bank, you tested positive for T. cruzi. And we know this because they, they come to our community science account saying, what do I do? But the vast majority are immigrants or have an extensive travel history in Latin America. It's a, a minority are um, epidemiologically determined to be locally acquired cases. And that's that's what I pointed that that new review paper. There were 76 of these locally acquired cases. And that's, um, that's a number that's probably just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, another similar question with regard to humans. Uh, you know, you mentioned kissing bugs that tested positive for human DNA due to recent feeding and that they also tested positive for T. cruzi. Uh, what is being done on the human side in the U.S. Uh, with regard to Chagas, whether that be education, public awareness? Is there anything being done on the human side that you're aware of? Yeah, I think there's a lot that's being done, a lot more that could be done. Um, I know there's a big push for um, congenital Chagas disease in the United States, especially um, mothers who are pregnant here in the U.S., but uh, maybe immigrants from endemic regions um, or have risk factors uh, for newborn screening and, you know, screening of pregnant women is, I know, one push. Um, I'm sure others on the line could speak more to, you know, some of the other initiatives that are going on. But there's a Chagas task force uh, um, that's organized here out of Texas. Um, by Paula Stiegler Granados and, and other, she recently moved. Um, and this was in, initially funded by the CDC, but this brings together a group of um, researchers and clinicians and human medical doctors and veterinarians to kind of brainstorm on Chagas disease. Um, there's a, um, yeah, several other initiatives. And I, I mentioned, yeah, some of our findings of kissing bugs that get submitted to us. And when we do this whole molecular workup, we find out they're infected and they have evidence of having fed on a human. Um, what I want to emphasize is with this community science program, we actually have a good relationship with the state health department in many, not all, but many of the southern states. Um, some of them um, prefer or have programs where they can actually receive kissing bugs directly and um, divert bugs to the CDC for testing and kind of capture that information at the state 
public health level. And so we kind of serve as a middle middle person, middle man group to link together the submitters with their state. Um, and then in doing so, we hope to kind of learn about the outcome of that testing that's done outside of our lab. But whenever we get a bug that is found in a bedroom or the owner discloses like this bug fed on me or fed on my, my kid, we try to put them in contact with public health. So they've got a resource other than our research lab at a vet school to talk to. All right. Do you, do you have time for just a couple more? Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. Kind of switching gears a little bit. Um, someone asked if there is a risk of T. cruzi um, in food animals and the potential for transmission in undercooked meats. That's a great question. Uh, it's not one that we've worked on here. Um, I think it would come down to what type of meat and what are the chances that that animal um, has become infected? Um, so you might think about, are we eating, um, you know, feral hogs um, that might be out in these natural environments, you know, rooting around, eating insects, um, might have a higher chance of infection of the animal and potentially infection of the tissues that might be for human consumption um, versus, you know, uh, cattle and think about the way that they're raised and what would risk factors be there for encountering the vectors. Yeah, we don't, uh, I don't know of any current surveillance for trypanosoma cruzi infections in, um, in animals that are going on for human consumption, sort of commercially at least. I was in contact many years ago with a pathologist at a slaughterhouse and I think at the time he said, I've been working for 20 years and I've never seen anything that would make him think of Chagas disease in terms of lesions in the heart. Um, but it's an interesting question, especially since we know oral transmission can occur. And that's oral transmission usually of the insect stage of the parasite or the insect fecal stage of the parasite. Um, but there's been this cool work from animals showing that like scavengers and predators that might eat infected prey items, little rodents that might be infected, transmission can occur that way. So I think it's a, it's a good question. Excellent. Uh, we'll do one more question. We've got quite a few here that uh, um, I know you shared your email. Dr. Hamer, would you mind email questions being emailed to you? Yeah, no, that'd be fine. That'd okay. be great. My All right. Well, we'll go with one more because we're, we're kind of at our, at our hour mark. Uh, you mentioned that raccoons tend to have high circulating levels of T. cruzi when infected. Uh, is it known if there's any specific factors that correlate with how likely a host is to contribute to T. cruzi spread, such as size, how many times a host has been exposed, et cetera? Yeah, I think that's like ultimately what, you know, we want to work toward figuring that out. Um, so what is it? You know, is it is it diet? Is this oral transmission? So are these raccoons just... Um, eating a lot of insects? Are they hanging out? Uh, are the insects kind of, have the insects set up shop in their nidiculous habitat where the raccoons are? So the raccoons are in contact with the feces or they're being fed on and pooped on in that more uh, more traditional mode of transmission. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, size could be, I mean, uh, or, you know, what's attractive to a kissing bug? Is it the size of the animal? Because the bigger the animal, the more carbon dioxide and these other cues that are important for the vectors. Um, maybe a larger animal is giving off more of that. So the vector is more likely to know there's a blood meal there. I think there's a lot of factors, but it would come down to probably habitat, um, which is an index of how likely they are to in contact the, ve the vector. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And the last thing I'll uh, <clears throat> say, somebody put in the question and answer feature uh, that there is a book titled The Kissing Bug, A True Story of a Family, an Insect, and a Nation's Neglect of a Deadly Disease. Um, it is available on Amazon, and it has a nice shout out to Dr. Hamer, apparently. In the, in the. So with that, uh, we are over our hour, so I'm going to close the questions. I want to thank Dr. Hamer once again for an excellent presentation, uh, very informative and insightful. Um, I do want to advertise for our continuing education webinar series. We can't do this without volunteers like Dr. Hamer. Uh, so if you are interested in presenting a future webinar, we would definitely uh, take all comers and we would uh, appreciate it if you would uh, contact us. You can email me at admin, A-D-M-I-N, at acvpm.org, and we can get you linked up with the Continuing Education Committee um, and schedule you for a, a future webinar. So once again, Dr. Hamer, I thank you. I thank all the attendees. 
And with that, I will bid everyone a very happy afternoon and good evening. Thank you.